Good afternoon, everybody. We might get started. Thank you for coming today, and welcome to being a refugee in Indonesia. I'd like to start by acknowledging the Bedigal people that are traditional custodians of this land. I'd also like to pay my respects to the elders, both past and present, and extend that respect to other Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders who are present here today. Today, we're very fortunate to have two eminent speakers who have come to UNSW to discuss the social and legal situations for asylum seekers and refugees in Indonesia. Our first speaker today is Nicholas Tun, a PhD fellow at the Danish Institute for Human Rights and Aarhus University in International Refugee Law, whose doctorate looks at state cooperation in the field of migration control. Nick is an Australian lawyer and former officer at the Australian Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade. He also holds a Master of Law from the University of Copenhagen and Bachelors of Laws and Arts from the University of Melbourne. He is currently a visiting researcher at the Caldor Centre for International Refugee Law. And Nick will start us off today with a, a general introduction focusing on the legal status of asylum seekers and refugees and the lack of effective protection in Indonesia. Nick will be followed by our second speaker, Antje Misbach, who is a senior research fellow at Monash University in Melbourne. Antje's current research interests include transit migration, diaspora politics, as well as border and mobility studies. She studied Southeast Asian Studies and Anthropology at Humboldt University in Berlin and obtained a PhD from the Australian National University for a thesis about the long-distance politics of the Archinese diaspora. During her postdoctoral fellowship at the Melbourne Law School, she conducted long-term fieldwork on asylum seekers stuck in transit in Indonesia, and since 2013, she has carried out research on people smuggling networks in Indonesia. Her latest publications include Troubled Transit, Asylum Seekers Stuck in Indonesia, and Linking People, Connections and Encounters Between Australians and Indonesians. After Nick's introduction, Antje will talk about what happened to the Rohingya stranded in Indonesia, and look at how this group has been treated quite differently compared to other groups in that country. Uh, after the two speeches today, we'll have time for a question and answer session. And please do note that we are recording today's session, so if you would like your question not to be included in the recording, please come and let us know afterwards. So thank you very much, everyone. It's Nick to start. And um, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank Jane, Francis, Claire, Madeline, Kelly for hosting me the past four weeks. It's been a productive and energizing stay. Um, and on the work of the Caldor Centre, generally there's a Chinese curse you may know, may you live in interesting times. The centre is doing excellent work in interesting times. Today I'll provide you a legal overview of the status of asylum seekers and refugees in Indonesia, drawing on an article. Um, currently under revision with the International Journal of Refugee Law, and thanks particularly to Madeline for her comments on that article. Um, this will be the shape of my brief presentation. I'm looking forward more to questions and discussion. Um, I'll add this sort of legal skeleton and allow Ancha to add some meat and colour through her social analysis. I'll provide an overview of the limited legal effect, uh, protections afforded asylum seekers and refugees under both international and national law, and finally discuss any prospects for future protection of refugees in Indonesia. As many of you will know, Indonesia has been a transit country for asylum seekers and refugees uh, dating back to the 1970s with the exodus of Indo-Chinese by boat some 40 years ago, and between the 1970s and 1990s, Indonesia provided asylum on a temporary basis including on Gullen Island. What this map will show you is the complexity of transit migration through Indonesia. And Indonesia's location and geography, the country itself is made up of 17,000 islands with a coastline of 55,000 kilometers, make its porous borders almost impossible to control. There's been a sort of second wave of transit migration through Indonesia dating back to 1999, when the rise of the Taliban in Afghanistan and conflict in Iraq, persecution in Iran, we started to see asylum seekers and refugees again make their way to Indonesia 
seeking onward passage to Australia or resettlement by the UN Refugee Agency. More recently, these groups have been joined by Rohingya asylum seekers. And thus far, Indonesia has been relatively tolerant of the presence of asylum seekers and refugees on its territory, but is not formally committed to the international refugee regime, or indeed the Refugee Convention. And I'd suggest that there remain some significant legal gaps in Indonesia's handling of transit migrants. So to give you a snapshot of what we're seeing on the ground today, Indonesia hosts more than 14,000 asylum seekers and refugees, the almost half or around half from Afghanistan, but also Iraq, Iran, Myanmar and Somalia, seeking a durable solution by resettlement or onward passage to Australia. However, it's worth noting that these 14,000 pale in comparison to neighbouring countries Malaysia and Thailand. Malaysia hosts some 97,000 refugees and 54,000 asylum seekers. And Thailand has 110,000 refugees and 8,000 asylum seekers, as well as a half a million stateless persons. But asylum seekers and refugees in Indonesia are a topical question today, uh, particularly given Australia's uh, return to the policy of turning back boats and the cessation of resettlement of refugees from Indonesia. This has closed off the possibility of onward travel, leaving more and more asylum seekers in Indonesia for longer and longer periods. This has been described in the press recently as a bottleneck in Indonesia, but it is worthwhile to say that we haven't seen a significant spike in numbers, rather a modest growth over some years. Turning then to, international, uh, to relevant international law, as you would know, like most Southeast Asian nations, Indonesia is not a party to the Refugee Convention. This lack of international protection for refugees is exacerbated by the absence of a regional human rights instrument like those found in Europe and the Americas. However, since Reformasi, Indonesia has ratified a number of key human rights treaties, uh, including the Convention Against Torture or CAT in 1998, thereby um, codifying its commitment to the principle of non refoulement Indonesia has also ratified the ICCPR, the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, and the Convention on the Rights of the Child, or the CRC, all human rights treaties which contain provisions relevant to the protection of asylum seekers and refugees. These protections include, for example, non refoulement freedom from torture, or other cruel, inhuman, or degrading treatment or punishment, the right to liberty security, and the right to education. And so what I argue is that drawing on Indonesia's human rights treaties, we have this patchwork of protections, albeit limited, to be afforded to asylum seekers and refugees. However, these do fall short of international refugee protection, given the absence of the national asylum system. That's not to say, however, that Indonesian law is silent on the question of asylum seekers and refugees. I would say it just lacks mechanisms for implementation. Article 28G of the Indonesian Constitution inserted the right to asylum into national law for the first time in 1999, and law number 39 of that year on human rights refers to Indonesia's moral and legal responsibility to respect, execute and uphold the Universal Declaration on Human Rights, Article 14 of which provides the right to seek and enjoy asylum in another country. Indonesia has long provided for the right to political asylum but as far as I'm aware, this has rarely ever been exercised. And I would argue that access to national asylum only exists in formal law, but not on the ground. Law number 37 of 1999 Human on Foreign Relations does provide for a mechanism for the granting of asylum. The president can grant asylum on a discretionary basis, but there's no evidence that Article 25 has ever been used. Article 26 of that law provides that asylum shall be exercised in accordance with national legislation, taking into account international law, custom and practice, thereby striking a balance between Indonesia's international law obligations and its national law standards. The granting of asylum does not require adherence to, for example, the, Indonesia, the refugee definition under the 51 Convention. Article 27 of this law, law number 37 of 1999, provides that there should be a refugee policy set out by presidential decree. 
this residential decree is currently under the consideration and hasn't been released as yet, and I'll come to that later. But in practice, the right to asylum at the national level is unrealisable, and Indonesia delegates refugee status determination to the UN Refugee Agency. However, even when a person is found to be a refugee in Indonesia, this does not guarantee a durable solution. Although UNHCR negotiates resettlement for refugees in third countries, only a relatively small number are resettled each year. I think we saw earlier around 800 of 14,000 in 2015. The Immigration Law of 2011 um, governs the status of immigrants in Indonesia but does not provide for asylum seekers or refugees. As a result, under current national law, there is no legal category for people seeking or recognised as needing international protection. Instead, those without status are considered illegal immigrants. And given many asylum seekers enter Indonesia clandestinely via Malaysia without documentation, using people smugglers, um, at the point they are apprehended without a valid visa, they become legally illegal migrants. At this point, under the 2011 law, asylum seekers and refugees are required to be placed in immigration detention, though there are some exceptions set out for children, the sick, pregnant women, and victims of human trafficking or smuggling. However, due to the limited capacity of Indonesia's detention system, most asylum seekers and refugees are in fact not detained. Only around 4,000 of the 14,000 are currently in detention. There is an important series of administrative directives um, from the Director General of Immigration that do deal specifically with asylum seekers and refugees and do protect from reform. However, these are not legally binding um, and do, are not sufficient to provide a national legal framework on the question of asylum. So to move then from this overview to look forward to consider some future prospects for asylum seekers and refugees in Indonesia, I'd like to draw the distinction between this notion of temporary asylum and refugee protection. On the one hand, Indonesia has for a long time and is still providing a basic form of asylum by respecting the principle of non-refoulement and allowing UNHCR access to conduct status determinations. However, there remains a lack of durable solutions for refugees on its territory. As you would know, there are three available dur uh, durable solutions according to UNHCR. Firstly, voluntary repatriation, possible where people are safe to return to their country of origin. Secondly, resettlement, as we've discussed, relatively unlikely in the Indonesian context. And thirdly, local integration. At present, local integration is not an option. But to consider the future prospects for protection in Indonesia, I'd like to draw on three aspects I consider particularly relevant. Firstly, at the level of ASEAN within the region, there's a general lack of uptake of refugee law within Southeast Asia. Other scholars have found that Southeast Asian states have simply never felt obliged to sign on to refugee law. A number of states have pointed to the costs of ratification as being too great, while Malaysia has argued that national security prevents ratification. Indonesia itself has pointed to the transnational drug trade and the fear of creating a pull factor in uh, possible ratification of the convention. And we can see that within ASEAN there's been very little appetite to deal with asylum and refugee issues. This is perhaps most dramatically characterised in the Rohingya crisis of last year, where in, uh, ASEAN's failure to respond to people floating at sea on boats um, was simply left to individual member states. A second factor is Australia and Indonesia's bilateral relationship. Um, I'm sure this will come up in questions, so I don't want to speak too um, lengthily on this, but cooperation on this matter dates back to around the year 2000, and Australia and Indonesia have a range of <coughs> regional or bilateral cooperation models they work within. My overriding observation is that, like the bilateral relationship, cooperation in this area has ebbed and flowed, and currently is at a very low ebb. 
Also, the relationship with Australia in this area tends to focus on deterrence and border control rather than rights and refugee protection. And while Australia has had some influence in this area over um, Indonesian policy, it's not fair to say that it's simply a case of policy transfer. And to return to this finally, this draft presidential decree, which may for the first time set out an Indonesian position on asylum seekers and refugees in national law. As I've mentioned, it's currently in development under Article 37 of Law no, sorry, Article 27 of Law 37 on Foreign Relations. When adopted, it will provide a national legal framework for the handling of asylum seekers and refugees. And the development of this draft shows that Indonesia is interested is interested in its own terms on developing such a legal framework and may possibly set out some commitment to the international refugee regime. However, from the drafts I've seen, it looks quite unlikely that local integration will be part of this um, national framework and it's unclear whether basic rights such as education and employment will be provided for in the presidential decree. In short, the Presidential Declaration is unlikely to provide durable solutions in Indonesian territory, and refugees are likely to remain tolerated rather than protected. Ancha, over to you. Thank you everybody for coming, uh, and many thanks to the Carter Center for putting up uh, this lunch seminar. I thought I'd give you an overview, I'm going to show you some pictures of what happened to the Rohingya um, that were very much in the media last year. And the reason why I think it's interesting to look what happened to them over the last couple of months is that they have been treated quite differently compared to other asylum seekers and refugees coming to Indonesia. And as Nick mentioned before, they're mostly from Afghanistan, and but also countries like Somalia, Sri Lanka. So the Rohingya are special. Uh, most of you will remember that um, in May 2015, actually, fishermen rescued hundreds of dehydrated and emaciated people drifting in boats off the coast in Aceh. And the background to this is uh, that since 2012, we have seen a series of violent riots between ethnic Buddhists and Rohingya Muslims, and the conflict has escalated uh, in Rakhine State. About 100,000 people were displaced inside Myanmar, and tens of thousands have fled to uh, neighboring Bangladesh. However, often, more than often, Bangladesh denies some basic rights as well. So, since 2014, about 94,000 uh, refugees and migrants have departed by sea from Bangladesh or Myanmar due to a systematic persecution. Many Rohingya were driven in the arms of people smugglers, hoping to reach Malaysia with, the help, with their help, either by land or by sea. Uh, after the discovery of mass graves in the remote jungles um, of southern Thailand, but also um, uh, northern Malaysia, the police started to crack down on these smuggling networks and the, the smugglers abandoned their clients uh, at sea, drifting basically on boats in the Andaman Sea for weeks. Um, fearing that more people uh, would make their way um, after these clampdowns, the naval authorities in Indonesia, Thailand, and Malaysia decided to prevent boats from disembarking. On several instances, they gave um, people on board food and uh, fuel, but pushed the boats back into the sea. This deadly ping pong left hundreds of Rohingya stuck at sea for more than a week. Finally, due to massive international pressure, Malaysia, Indonesia, and Thailand reached a joint agreement. Indonesia and Malaysia, they both pledged to take altogether 7,000 people and allow, them, and allow them to be processed in their respective uh, territories. The condition was that all the uh, costs would have to be uh, carried out by the international community, so they had the financial responsibility. So at first, this offer looked quite like an like animus uh, gesture, it looked great, but when looking slightly more closely at this, um, it's actually less impressive. Um, Indonesia and Malaysia offered a temporary shelter only, insisting that the resettlement or the repatriation process must be completed within one year. And it was very clear from the very beginning uh, that this was a totally unrealistic time frame. Because in Indonesia, currently, with the limited uh, UNHCR staff, um, refugee status determination, status determination takes between two and four years. Waiting for the actual uh, resettlement process to, to come through can take several more years. Um, ever since uh, Australia has indicated or has uh, ruled out that they will no longer be taking um, recognized refugees, um, 
who had it first uh, registered in Jakarta in by, uh, um, July 2014, resettlement numbers have actually gone down. Um, having this uh, strict ultimatum makes the Rohingya case quite uh, different because no other asylum seeker group, be it people from Afghanistan, Pakistan, or Iran, had ever uh, had ever had to face such a restrictive limit. So bearing in mind that the uh, state-driven search and rescue operations might have come too late in some instances, it was basically only 1,800 people who came to shore in action. The large percentage of women and minors was quite striking among this group. Um, and, among, and among these 1,800 people, about 1,000 people identified themselves as Rohingya. And the others said they were from Bangladesh. This is important not only because these two groups were immediately housed in different places, but those people who said that they were from Bangladesh um, were repatriated quite quickly into Bangladesh. Uh, considering the lack of transparency about the procedures adopted in the registration procedures, it might be possible that among the people returned to Bangladesh were in fact some Rohingya. Myanmar from the very beginning refused uh, to cooperate in the repatriation of the Rohingya. Um, yeah, this is basically just some dates, um, what happened last year, but more interestingly, the other uh, chart shows you that there have always been certain waves of uh, Rohingya coming out of uh, Myanmar. So even though last year it was very much in the media, there have been um, incidents in the previous years. Okay, so um, the local authorities in Aceh, they were very much hoping to integrate the Rohingya as quickly as possible into local communities, but they were unable to do so because of the national restrictions that prohibit refugees from integration, and Nick has explained this in more detail. So instead, and in order to prevent um, spontaneous integration, the Rohingya were then accommodated in, accommodated in camps, and as widely known, uh, Camps are not only very expensive to maintain, but living in camps is very detrimental for the well-being of people who are kept there. The Rohingya were kept in um, four camps all over Aceh, and the conditions in each of these camps um, varied quite uh, drastically. In some cases, and I will show you some pictures later, Rohingya had to live in tents. In other places, they were allowed to live in barracks. Um, some, female, some families were allowed to stay together, whereas on other sides, men were separated from women and children. Amnesty International has said that the camps failed to meet even the basic needs of the Rohingya. Sanitation is poor, the, the tents provide very little protection uh, from bad weather, particularly during the rainy season. Um, but there were also significant threats to the security of the Rohingya in those camps. There was abuse by security staff, there was lack of protection from smugglers and traffickers who were coming into the uh, camps. But there were also instances of local gangs entering the camps, trying to rob asylum seekers, um, particularly after they have been given their weekly allowances in terms of extra food or clothing, this sort of thing. In September last year, four women um, were forwarded complaints about uh, sexual uh, assault. Um, and Within a few hours, the entire camp was cleared because people were running away in, in fear. Some of them returned after a couple of days, but the problem here is that um, the police uh, investigation stopped it halfway through, and uh, some of the women has, have now disappeared, so we probably might have uh, big problems to find out what actually happened there. So as I said, like, I'm going to show you some pictures um, of how these camps look like. Um, People can cook for themselves, um, they are being provided with food. That's often a, a big uh, disadvantage if for more than like a year you have to live off food that other people give to you. Like some of the most intimate um, enjoyments of daily, daily lives are not being granted in these camps. Um, that's a, another camp and you can see these kind of half open tents. It's extremely hot during daytime. Um, and that's uh, a camp of South in Aceh, um, where men and women were separated. Um. <coughs> so there are a number of important differences in the way Rohingya have been treated compared to other asylum seekers and refugees. So, um, like 
other asylum seekers on the one hand they have no right to work they have no access to education and they have no chance of ever becoming a nation citizens or integrating into society but as a persecuted and Muslim minority uh, the Rohingya have seen unprecedented solidarity from Indonesian individuals and organizations so from the very beginning there was lots of food and clothes that were sent to the camps particularly uh, particularly around Muslim holidays sometimes even more than what was needed these donations are now definitely sl uh, slowly drying up. Um, also, there was uh, much more concern for the plight of the Rohingya among uh, Indonesian civil society organizations, which until then had rather shown little concern for asylum seeker issues more generally. Um, but some of the NGOs um, or the civil society organizations, they had rather limited experience and they were rather unfamiliar with the international standards of uh, care for asylum seekers and refugees, and that made their involvement, particularly in the camps, rather problematic. For example, they did receive a lot of uh, donations, both in material but also financial, um, but judging from the quality of the temporary shelters that some of the NGOs have built, um, one is wondering where did all this money go. Um, local authorities in, in Luxembourg, for example, they also have uh, complained about the interference of these organizations that have, in a way, undermined uh, security arrangements in the camp. Um, in one of the camps, an, an NGO started to arrange uh, marriages. Unfortunately, these arranged marriages also included underage girls um, because they thought it was inappropriate for unmarried men and women to be living in the same camp. And, well, maybe that's a uh, particular thing uh, for Aceh. Um, so Indonesia does not allow for local integration of refugees. So the Rohingya, they can in a way only hope for resettlement, but um, given that the uh, worldwide uh, capacities for resettlement are extremely uh, low, only about 1% of all the refugees um, gets accepted for resettlement worldwide, the hopes of the Rohingya are, in a way, probably misplaced uh, because they are, to be honest, at the bottom end of the uh, so-called desirability scale for refugees. Uh, they lack formal education, some of them are illiterate. Um, also, I guess we have to remember that Australia made it quite clear uh, that they would not uh, step in and resettle um, Rohingya. So far from what we know, um, only three people from these camps in Aceh have been resettled to Canada. Lingering in these camps with nothing to do and unable to, add, to earn a living, the Rohingya are stuck. Most of the Rohingya therefore have decided to abscond over the last uh, months and they were hoping to reach Malaysia, which had always been their uh, yeah, original um, destination. However, in, in order to cross the Straits of Malacca, the only way to do this is once again uh, to rely on the services of the smugglers to take them over by boat. So in a way we have seen uh, an increase of smuggling uh, activities in the Straits of Malacca. So in the beginning I mentioned there were 1,807 people in these camps in Aceh and uh, by the end of January there were only 275 Rohingya left. I guess by now it's probably even less than this. Um, so it's likely that when the one year deadline expires in May this year, well maybe all the uh, Rohingya have vanished from Aceh. And the reasons why I put up these pictures is like the top one is a deserted shelter in Aceh, but the other one um, is a site where back in October there were some initiatives to bring together all the uh, asylum seek, uh, all the Rohingya from all these different um, camps, so they started clearing um, an oil palm plantation, uh, they put up a big signboard of vision of almost like a luxury uh, center that they were hoping to build, but it's one of the many initiatives that actually led to nothing, that just nothing came through from this. So it's this empty spot in the middle of nowhere. Um, so at this point in time, it's not quite clear what will, what will happen to the remaining Rohingya in Aceh. Um, in the second half of last year, it was only about 1,600 people who, who departed by sea from the Bay of Bengal, um, mostly because of the increased scrutiny of the authorities, both at the departure but also at the arrival points. Depending on what the, the current political transition Myanmar might bring, bring um, it remains to be seen whether the conditions for Rohingya will improve or not. Um, 
But I think we cannot rule out uh, that in the future there might be a Rohingya coming to uh, Indonesia or Malaysia. But even if there are no more Rohingya coming, I think Indonesia and its neighbors needs to develop strategies of what to do in case of future mass displacements in the region. Um, as we have feared, Indonesia has not signed a refugee convention and it does not provide effective protection for refugees um, because it doesn't have any legal frameworks uh, to do so. Um, and to be honest, the signs for Indonesia signing onto the convention at the moment, they are not very positive. However, it has to be acknowledged that over the last couple of years, Indonesia has actually been quite interested in building um, regional collaborations. Um, but the main regional forums in charge of uh, irregular migration and forced displacements. So this is on one side the Bali process, and on the other hand it's the Jakarta Declaration process, and to some extent, of course, ASEAN, which issued the ASEAN Human Rights Declaration that affirms the right to asylum. So unfortunately, these regional forums, um, they have not played a leading role when it came to addressing the Rohingya issue in the last years. Despite a number of emergency meetings, no action was taken. And it's highly regrettable because I think uh, the Rohingya case did in a way present a good opportunity to start thinking about building a regional architecture for, the protect, for a more protection-oriented framework on how to handle mass displacement in the Asian Pacific. So while we are waiting for regional initiatives to come through, maybe, hopefully, um, it might be worth to consider alternative options for current and future forcibly displaced people seeking protection in Southeast Asia. If return to the country of origin uh, is not an option, and if uh, resettlement to a third country is also not uh, a viable option, well, that pretty much only leaves um, local integration. And maybe in a slightly provocative, provocative manner, we could also ask, is it really impossible for a 250 million people country like Indonesia to integrate 1,800 Rohingya? I, I won't uh, answer this now. Um, but you can discuss if you like. Um, I think I'm going to conclude briefly um, with saying that I think we do have to uh, acknowledge Indonesia's role in accommodating the Rohingya who arrived in May 2015. That has to be recognized. Um, none of the Rohingya has been returned to Myanmar. And from this regard, uh, Indonesia has fulfilled its, cus um, its yeah, customary international law obligations. Um, to respect the principle of non wilful norm, which prohibits the transfer of asylum seekers to another place where they face persecution and abuse. However, it remains open to questions, I think, uh, on whether or not the so-called voluntary repatriation of people back to Bangladesh has put any of them under the risk of persecution or human rights violations. Responding to the emergency at sea, the Indonesian government uh, granted temporary residence to the Rohingya until May 2016. It has devoted substantial uh, resources to accommodating them and provided for their basic needs. The local government in Aksha, uh, in particular, has assisted with uh, the humanitarian process. And I mentioned that uh, numerous um, NGOs have provided for the Rohingya when it came to housing, food, Medicare, and education, basic levels. Um, but rather than responding in an ad hoc manner, I think Indonesia still needs to establish a proper legal framework for handling asylum seekers and refugees in the, in the, in the future. Um, and since the arrival of the Rohingya last year in, in May, particularly NGOs but also bureaucrats have urged the government to enact this presidential decree on handling asylum seekers and refugees, which has been in the making for several years. However, it still hasn't come through. Um, I think um, when having such a domestic legal provision, it would not only fill um, an obvious legal gap, but I guess when applied consistently, it might also provide more fairness and equal treatment for all asylum seekers and refugees in Indonesia. And maybe just as a final explanation here, you see that there are still asylum seekers coming and registering uh, with UNHCR in Jakarta on, on a monthly basis. So, despite a lot of changes that happened or changes that have been introduced by the Australian government, because coming of uh, asylum seekers to Indonesia has not been stopped. So, let me thank you for your attention, and um, I'd like to also point out uh, to a special edition of Inside Indonesian, which uh, was. Uh, published last week, um, and we do have some of the contributors amongst us.
so she is one of them. Uh, and uh, from the Calder Center, it was uh, Sophie who has pro provided a very good uh, article. So please check out the web page. Thank you for your attention. Thank you.